the prostitution of tithes and offering in the church. Is it scriptural to give special recognition to people who, who are givers, especially who are tithers? What that means is, is it scriptural for a pastor or the leadership of a church to actually point out members of the church and group them based on the fact that, but based on how much money they give, based on how much a giver they are, or how much a tighter they are. Is it scriptural for the leadership of a church to record the offerings and the tithes of members and then be recognizing them just to recognize them at the end of the year? And how scriptural it is in the first place for the attitude, I mean, for mm, people to be honored and recognized based on money and giving. How is that scriptural? How much is that scriptural? Is it scriptural that it is money that determines the significance and the importance of church members? So how scriptural is that? How scriptural is that? That your significance in the church is now being determined by how much you are able to give. So if you don't have money to give, or if you happen to give low amount of money, you are a low, uh, low budget person in the church, it means you are now less significant, less important than the other guy that has fat, fat purse or fat pocket. So how is it, the topic of today is, how scriptural is it? to honor and recognize and give special recognition to people in church due to how much money they give. And uh, my, my sister-in-law, uh, who is uh, Rosalind Amaka Banjoko, she told me that she was a member of a church, a big church, a big denomination, where... At the, you know, they actually take record of how much every church member gives. And then they categorize you by how much money you give or you could give or offer to the church. So the people who bring more money, they are regarded as the VIP members. So at the end of the year or at the end of the month, they kind of try to honor you because you are bringing money to the church. Just secular stuff. Every, the same thing that is happening in the corporate world, in a multi-level marketing, multi-level marketing industry, the same thing has now been brought to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the difference then between the church and this multi-level business? What is the difference between the church and the corporate world. How scriptural is it? Because what we want to do is not just that it works. Because a lot of people today, a lot of pastors and a lot of uh, a lot of leaders, a lot of church leaders, they want to behave as if the most important thing is that it works. As long as it works, as long as it's bringing people and it's bringing in money, then we have to do it. Do we just use pragmatism as the only basis for us to do, take decisions and that what we do is only depending on if it works or it's not working. Or do we use another criteria as the reason why we do what we do in the church? I happen to believe that 
we should use the criteria of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did the author of the church say about giving and about treating people in the church? Should our attitude and our um, reaction and our treatment of church members be based solely on how much they give or not? How scriptural is this? And how right is this? Or how wrong it is? And I want to say it is absolutely wrong because it is non-scriptural. We should never base our relationship, not just in the church, even in the world, you even at work, even in the secular world, a society should never base their attitude and their response to people just on the basis of their net worth. Because everybody has a worth. God has created everybody in his uh, and in her image. And just because you carry the image of God, just because you, you are in the likeness of God, that is enough for you to deserve respect. But when it comes to the church, you are even supposed to be respected more. Not just because you carry the image of God alone, but because you are weak. The church is a place where it, people who are weak should be celebrated. The church is a place where people should be recognized and given rec special recognition that because they are weak. Actually, what is more scriptural, I will prove to you today that what is scriptural is not to give, is not to give special recognition to people who have money or based on the money and the wealth of people. But actually, special recognition should be based on people who are on the weakness of people, on how much disadvantaged people are, on how much help people need. That is what should decide who should be given special recognition. And this is not my opinion. This is the opinion of the author and finisher of our faith. This is the opinion of the person who started, this church, who started the church. So before I begin to go into the scriptures, I would like you, if you have not yet invited everybody that you know to come and listen to this message, go ahead and do it. Go look for your share button. Press that share button. It will give you the option to invite publicly everybody or just a few. Invite everybody. And I want to start right now. We are going full time into the scriptures right now. Now, the Bible says in the book of Corinthians. So if you have your Bible, open your Bible to the book of Corinthians. Now, the book of Corinthians are two books. So we are going to open the first book of Corinthians. So let's open 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to prove to you today that special recognition should never be given to people in the church based on money. Special recognition should never be given to people in the church based on their giving ability. People should never be honored above others just because they have fat Pause, and they bring more money than the others. People should never be you know, elevated above the others in the church just because they are the highest giver. And I also want to prove to you today that even the practice of taking note and taking record of what people bring and taking the 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 no, I mean the taking the the, the yeah the information of people on how much they break, they brought and how much they give to the church is wrong it's unscriptural because the bible tells us in matthew that your left chapter 6 that what your left hand is doing your right hand should not know it nobody should know you should if the pastor should not know how much money you bring Nobody should be cross-checking and checking out on how much money you bring. Nobody should even know who are the top givers or who are the least givers. Nobody should be honored above another person in the church just because he brings more money. This is not the kingdom of this world. This is the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, Jesus himself prohibits this. God himself prohibits this. Bible itself prohibits this practice. And that's why I want us to right now go. No, I'm not talking about the ones that need to do that for tax and return purposes. I'm talking of churches that are in Africa that don't need tax, you no know, return purposes, that don't do tax. 
but that are honoring people. So some people want to use the tax argument as a cover-up. That I'm not using that now. That's not what I'm talking about right now. Even if you need to do it for tax purposes, you should keep it private. You should keep it confidential. It is only the people who are, you know, the, the bookmakers that should know about it and return it to the tax agencies, but they shouldn't be making it known and you allow it to determine their attitude to people in the church. You should, even if you know the, the person who is giving more than the other, that should not determine your attitude to that person, that your attitude should be better to that person than the other person. So it is, it is not the tax deduction I'm talking about. I'm talking about attitude. I'm talking about attitude after you found out who is giving more. I'm talking about preferential treatment. The preferential treatment of treating the highest bidder, treating the highest giver better than the lowest giver, than the ordinary giver. That is what I'm talking about. So don't bring in the tax argument here now. We are not talking about that. We are not talking about just taking record. We are talking about what follows after taking record. We are talking about taking record so that you will be able to honor. Because according to what I know, what I heard, is that people, they don't just take the record of the people who are the highest givers. They take their record and use that record to put them in category. You are the first category of the top givers. You are the second category. You are the third category. So because you are the highest category, we honor you specially. We invite you to special dinner. We invite you to special, special uh, meetings. And the reason is because you give more money than the other person. Whereas the offer and finish of our faith, the person who started this church, the founder of our church, the Lord Jesus Christ said that if you need to invite anybody to a party or if you need to invite anybody to a feast, that you should never invite people who give, who will be able to give you back, who will be able to thank you, who will be able to appreciate you. Don't invite those ones. You should invite the ones who are not able to thank you. You should invite the ones who are not able to say, uh, to give you anything back. Those are the ones you should invite. And that is the criteria why you should invite, why you should invite people. Because your father who is in heaven knows that you, what you have done. He sees your sacrifice and he will give you the reward. So if God is saying you should, you know, give honor to the people that don't, cannot afford it. That is who he said when you organize your party, invite people who cannot afford it. Invite people who, who, who cannot give you, who cannot say thank you to you, who cannot give you back. That is Christianity. But when we are now going to church, we are, you know, you are only honored. In fact, I even heard that in some churches, you know, you can even get to the pastor only if you are a giver. You can get to the pastor only if you are a tighter. So if you cannot, you know, if you are not bringing good amount of money, if you are not bringing good amount of tithe and offering, then you cannot, you know, get to the pastor. You cannot get to see the pastor. I even heard that you cannot even get help from welfare department of the church if you are not in the record book of the givers and the titers. It has even gotten so bad that some people will not even go to pray for you if you are in need, if you are not a giver or a titer. Or if you are not, you know, they will not give you any help that you might need. So how scriptural is this? And I want to tell you what is the real scripture by saying about it. What is Bible saying about this? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 14. Then from verse 14... Then from verse 22 to 27. Or you could read from verse 14 to verse 27. So I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, and then verses 22 to 27. So it says here, For the body is not one member, but many. Just like in any church. The, when it talks about the body here, yeah, it's talking about the church. For the church is not just one member. The church has many members. So, no, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble, they are the ones who are most necessary. See what the Bible is saying. The members of the church who seem to us to be the weakest, who seem to us to be the more feeble, 
They are the, the Bible said they are the most necessary members. They are the most important members. The people that should be treated with much honor and much dignity in the church are these members that we think are the least important. The drug addicts, the alcoholics, the bombs, the homeless, the old people, the senior citizens, the children, the poor, the orphans, the hungry, the thirsty, the desperate. So that's what the Bible is saying here. Those people that we think are the feeble, the most feeble. Let's take any church right now. Take your own church. Who are the people that get the most attention? Who are the people that, you know, get, you know, the most honor? Who are the people that get the most recognition? In your church, do they even recognize those categories of people who are the weak and feeble? Are the weak and feeble recognized at all in your own church? How do they recognize them? In fact, I heard that in some, there is a particular church in Nigeria where they have a big, big, big church. And people will come to this church for three days events or four days events when they have events going on. And you know, people will be, because they are sleeping, some of them are going home, some of them are coming back, some of them have their homes in the area there. And it gets so bad that the poor people being there for a week event, some of them do not have money to eat. Some of my friends went to this event to this event one time and they saw uh, like 200 or many more people just sitting down in different places. Couldn't even afford the bread. Some of them brought gari from home. Some of them will put, pour water into gari over there and be drinking gari while people are, you know, where what why people are just feasting? Why other people are just eating first class food? And they're just pass, passing by, passing them by. In fact, it got to the extent that some people were in those services and in those events, they were fasting for seven days. Some of them fast, was fasting for two weeks because there was nothing to, to eat. In fact, it's to the extent that some of them couldn't even drink water. There was no water for them to drink. They have to go and borrow and plead for people to give them water to drink. And the person who was telling me this knows the person who was responsible for the buffet, for the cafe and the buffet and the restaurant there, who was managing the restaurant. And the person told me that the money we were making, he was very close to the owner of the restaurant. He said, we, were, we didn't do, we not, we not do because the, these people will come in thousands, hundreds of thousands, that in that whole week, we will make millions upon millions. We will not even know where to, where to take money to. And the food that the rich people and the wealthy people will, will not finish, we will just go and throw them away and give them to the dogs. Why food are being given to the dogs in the same church? There was not one single announcement that if you cannot afford to eat, if you cannot afford to buy something, go and eat for free. Even the things... Go and even eat what the other book left, left over. But go and eat for free. But people will be hungry, sleeping on the floor, in the crusade ground. I mean, in, a, in an event, in a convention kind of place. And that is because it is the culture of our churches right now. It is not that to honor only people who are important. It has become the culture of most of our churches to honor only those people who are well to do. It is, has become a culture in our churches to honor only people who are successful. It has become the culture of our churches to honor and respect and give double honor only to the people who are the highest giver. Only to, the, to give to the people who are the top givers of the church. But it is no more the culture of our churches. It is only, even though it is the culture of the kingdom of God, to honor the least, 
in our midst, to honor the most feeble, the weakest in our midst. This is what the Bible says, that the only people that must be honored, the first people, the most important people to be honored in any given assembly, if you call yourself a church, if it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the people that must first of all be paid attention to are the people that cannot afford to do things for themselves, people that cannot afford to buy things for themselves, that cannot afford to clothe themselves, those that cannot afford to do for themselves what other men could do for themselves. Those who could not afford to do for themselves what even other men could do for them. Those people are the ones that needed to be helped, first of all. These people are the ones that needed to be given a helping hand. But instead of giving these people a helping hand, we neglect them. People sleep on the bare floor. People eat. People we will go hungry in the same church. And then we will still be asking for their offering. We will still be asking for their tithe. And then we will still be, you know, say, you know, neglecting them. What kind of Christianity is that? You want to tell me that is Christianity? You want to tell me that is church? You want to tell me that that is the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Because the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is, he is all about love. God is love. And that's why all the scriptures, even Old Testament and New Testament, is always emphasizing love. And the best way God has showed us to emphasize love, if in the Old Testament, the best way God showed to people to emphasize love was through jubilee. That they needed to forgive people of their debt. They needed to release them from captivity, from their slavery. They needed to make them free. Jubilee was the greatest idea of welfare that God had for the people of God. To be able to give them you no know, acceptance and to be able to you know, extend love and you no know, manifest love to all citizens of the country. But in the New Testament, there is no jubilee as such anymore because we are not the Jewish people, we are the people of God. But it's the Christ nature still remains. The nature of God still remains. And that nature of God is love. And that, that's why Jesus said, and he gave it to us as a commandment, that the only commandment is love. And that, but, when, but when it comes to the building of the church, he gave us concrete instruction. This is from the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, I just read it to you. That when it comes to the church, okay, no more jubilee. The jubilee is still with the children of Israel. But when it comes to the church, jubilee should be every day. The year of jubilee has come. Christ has brought the year of jubilee to everybody, which means that the kingdom of God is a leveler to everybody. Everybody is now equal. It is no more three years, or seven years before jubilee. We don't longer need to wait for seven years to get jubilee. We no longer we, we, uh, need to wait for a year to get jubilee. Jesus has brought the year of jubilee. It should be now jubilee every day for everybody who is in Christ. And that is what the church is supposed to do. How is that jubilee expressed? their jubilee he says that you must do good first of all to those people who are people of the household of God and that everybody who is weak must be exalted must be honored must be well taken care of even more than the ones who are strong it's just the same principle that we use in the society now for the disabled people for the uh, yeah disabled the, 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 why we have different you know roads for them we have different cars for them we have different seating for the arrangements for them why those who are strong they must bear the you know, the, the, the weakness of the of the weak they must bear the, the the burden of the weak and this is coming from the bible even some western countries are more christian in their attitude they are more christian in their you know policies than our churches our churches don't care. But God is saying that we, if we are in the church, let's see that scripture again. 1 Corinthians 12, 14. He says, For the body is not one member, but many. We are many to help each other. We are many to be able to assist one another. So, no, much more. Those members, he says, much more. Those members of the body that seem even more feeble, more weak, they are the ones that are more necessary. We should treat them with honor so much that as if they, they are more important, they are more necessary. But let's keep on reading. That's not the, that's not the, 
the whole thing. He says, if from verse 22, and those members of the body which we think to be of less honor or to be less honorable. You know, there are some members in the church that you look at them, you just think, they don't even look honorable at all. Maybe they are uh, disabled, maybe they are blind, maybe they are sick, maybe they are, you know, uh, you know, they are having some disability or the other. The Bible says that it is those ones that, that we look upon and think that they are, they, are, they are less honorable. The Bible says, upon these, we should bestow more abundant honor. More abundant honor. It is only in one place the Bible talks about giving double honor to the, to the pastors. And everybody is talking about that now. All the pastors are only talking, give double honor to pastor. Give double honor to pastor because he's teaching you. Give double honor to the men of God. But it's not just the, the pastor that should be giving double honor according to the Bible here. According to the Bible, the people that should even be giving more honor than the pastors are the members of the church that are weak, that are feeble, and that seem to us to be less honorable. So members of the church that are less honorable in our eyes that are less powerful, that are less important, that are less honorable, they are the ones that we should give and bestow upon more honor. And not just more honor, abundant honor. We should give to them more abundant honor than we are giving to the, to the other members of the church. So what is it that determines who should be honored in the church? What is it that determines how who should be respected in the church? Who should get more honor? Who should be who should be distinguished? Who should be recognized? It is their weakness. It is not how much powerful they are. It is not how much money they bring. If we do that, then we are just doing like the world. If we are doing like that, then there is no difference between us and the unbelievers. But the difference, the, the fact that we are all believers is the fact that we extend love. I am strong. I am not disabled. So when I see a disabled person, the only right thing to do is to use my strength to strengthen and to lift up the disabled person. In this kingdom, power is not meant to boast. Power is not meant to be pompous about or to brag about. Power is meant to be used to elevate, to promote, and to support the weaker. So if I have financial power, the reason why I have that financial power is so that I will use my finances to look for people who don't have financial possibilities and use my financial power to elevate them and to remove their disability financially. So if I'm physically strong and I see women who are, young, who are younger or who are just weaker or I see just people who are disabled and I'm strong, I should not just use my strength and say, oh, I can go work faster and walk past them and go to church and get a seat there quickly. No, the reason that, the, the fact that I'm a Christian, my love is demonstrated in the right use of power. And the right use of power is that I see somebody who is weaker than me and I use my power to cover for that person and to lift that person. If I, it's the same thing with politics. And that is why our politicians are like this because our churches are like this. Our politicians are using their power to oppress the, 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 the disenfranchised people, the weak people in the society, because our church has not been using power to elevate people. Our church also, in our churches, we use power to pull people down, to remove people for road. They say, come out for road, get out of here, because we are using, we are abusing power. We don't know the purpose of power. That's why our politicians are doing the same thing. But if our churches, will, first of all, will learn to use power to elevate, to use power to cover, to support, to strengthen others, then our politicians will begin to do the same thing sooner, sooner or later. But our politicians are corrupt because our church is first corrupt before our politicians is corrupt. So who are the people to be recognized in a church? That is why I always tell people, if you go to such a church where they are taking record of who is bringing tithe and offering so that they will recognize them, so that they will honor them, so that they will give them more recognition than other people in the church, just take your bag and leave that church. Or if you don't want to leave, maybe you try to correct them. 
If they will listen to you, you could stay. But if they will not listen, just leave your bag. I mean, just take your bag and leave that church. Because, uh, you know, the, the order of God and the, uh, the, uh, the principle in the Bible says this. And let me read it again. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 22. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. I'm actually reading 1 Corinthians 12, 14, then 22 to 20, 27. Those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. Upon these ones, you should be, we all as members should bestow more honor. And not just more honor, more abundant honor. More honor, more abundant honor, more respect, more recognition, more no, blessing, more recognition must be given to people who are weak, to people who are not able to support themselves, to people who don't have the money like other people. But for us to turn that around, okay, it's even bad enough that we are not recognizing the weak and the poor, that we are not giving them honor. It's bad enough that we don't give them honor. But to now turn the old Bible upside down on his head and now be taking the ones who are already strong, the ones who are already powerful, the ones who are already rich, and begin to make those ones the ones to be honored instead of the opposite of what God said, that you should honor the weak. But we are now honoring the powerful. Who is already powerful? And now you are honoring me again. So who will then take care of the weak? That is not the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is not the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church of our Lord Jesus Christ says, anywhere you see the weak, be around them. Use your strength to eliminate their weakness. If it is political strength you have, use your political power to eliminate their disenfranchisement. If it is financial power you have, use your resources to eliminate and, you know, their financial, you know, poverty and inadequacies as well. I keep on reading. So those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, the ones coming from the wrong side of the city, the ones living in the, in the slums, the ones who, who are homeless, the ones we call area boys or homeless people or orphan, orphans or, you know, uh, you know, widows and, uh, you know, oh, you know, old citizens. The ones that we think are weak and dishonorable. The Bible says that those people are the ones we must bestow on more honor, more abundant honor must be bestowed on them than on other people who are already doing well, who could bestow honor upon themselves by themselves. And our uncomely part of the church, they are, they are, in every church, in every body, you always have the uncomely part. All That uncomely part must have more abundant comeliness, care, more abundant care. More abundant care must be given to those People, to those people in the church, to those parts of the church that we think to be unwelcoming. The members of the church, the areas of the church, the people in the church that we think they are not dignified, they are not rich, they are not well to do. More care, more abundant care must be given to them. This is the church. If this is not in the church, that is no more church. Oh. You could call it a club or you could call it a cult. You could call it anything you want to call it, but not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to now remind you of what happened in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5. There was nobody in need. None of the members of the church that were in need. Why? Because they understood this. They understood this scripture. They understood the heart of God. They understood the mind of the Father. They understood that this kingdom is the kingdom of love. They understood that this is all about love of God, care for other people, that this God is about love, and that there is no way we could say we are brothers and sisters, and one is suffering and we are living in abundance. There is just no way that will be church. So in the Acts of the Apostles, in the earlier church, there was nobody in need. That's what the Bible says. 
No one was in need. Everybody, even who had something, was selling what they had to be able to carry out this injunction, to be able to use their resources and their money to take care of the less, the less, less, less fortunate people in the society. I keep on reading First Corinthians chapter twelve. It says, "For our comely parts, that is our respectable part, our successful part of the body." We already have no need. We already have no need because we're already taken care of. If they're already rich, if they're already bringing big tithe and offering, why should you honor them again? They're already doing well. But God had tempered the body together. God brought everybody together, both the weak and the strong, both the rich and the poor, so that we might be able to help liquidate the deficiencies. So God has brought the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lack. So the purpose of the church, the purpose of the body, is to be able to provide for those part of the part of the body that lack. Anybody in the church that lacks anything, we are here to take care of them. That there should be no schism, no conflict, no disagreement. There should not be schism in the body. Nobody should be dissatisfied, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Not even the church alone should do that. Even members should be, should be reasonable enough to be able to do that. And whether one member suffers, then all the, if, if, if a member suffers, all the members of the church, all the members suffer as well. Or if one member is honored, then all the members of the church rejoice. Now you are the body of Christ, members in particular. So we are the ones that are supposed to make sure that no member of our church suffers while we are living in abundance. I mean, and it's not just member of the church alone, but member of the society. This is how we are supposed to live in the society as well. We are supposed to take care of the needy. We are never supposed to pass by anybody that has any need. That is the lesson that Jesus taught us in the story of the Samaritan, the good Samaritan. We, this is how the church is supposed to be operated. This is how the society is supposed to be operated. Acts chapter 4, verse, 37, verse 34 to 37. Acts chapter 4, verse 37. Uh, 4 to 37. It says, Neither was there any among them that lacked. There was no one that lacked in the first church. Why? Because as many as were possessors of land and houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold to the church and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according to as he had in need of. So they were meeting the needs of every member of the church according to the needs and the needs that people had. The church, the apostles, made sure that they had a system in place to use the money that people are bringing to meet the needs of every other member of the church and the society at large. So they were not putting the money in their pocket. They were using the money to meet the needs of other people. But the Bible has told us that we should use uh, we should, you know, we should search the scriptures. Let's look at, at other other scriptures and see what other scripture says. Let's go to the book of uh, James. Let's go to the book of James, chapter two, from verses two to four. It says, "For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel." And there should also come in a poor man, in a poor man, in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves? And become judges with evil thoughts. This is exactly what we are talking about. It's even written black and white directly. It's written clearly. I mean, you can, it cannot be more clearer than this. 
And can you believe it? Still, church is mis mis misrepresenting God. Church will still not pay attention to this. The church is still on doing the very opposite of what God said we should never do. The church will, is still telling people who are poor. In fact, I even know, in, even in this church in, in, in Ukraine here and many other places, I know that there are people, there are churches where they will not even allow the poor people to come to church. They will not even allow them to enter the, ch the church. They will not even allow them to sit anywhere they want. They will not even welcome them in the church. And the Bible says, listen to me, my brethren, in verse 5. Had not God chosen the poor of this world, that James 2, I started from verse 2. Has, not, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be the rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which we, he had promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat. He said, but you have suffered from the hand of the rich in the world now. Have you never suffered from the hand of the rich and the powerful and the privileged? Have political, no, you know, oppressors never oppressed you before? Why should you now come to church and still be oppressing and tolerating oppression? Have you not suffered from political, you know, uh, you know, you know, injustice? Why should you now come to church and be practicing the same injustice? He said, by so doing, you, you, you blaspheme that worthy name. By which you are called Christians. We are blasphemers. By treating people like this, by honoring people who are rich above people who are poor, by disrespecting people who are poor and just honoring people who are rich, you we the Bible says we are blasphemers. We are blaspheming the name of the Lord, and we are blaspheming the name that by which we are called. Verse 8: If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. You love the poor and the weak and the feeble like yourself. That is only when you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin. You know, in our churches today, we are talking about sin. What do we call sin? So you are smoking, it means you are sinning. You are drinking, it means you are a sinner. I don't, I'm not condoning smoking and drinking, right? But that's what we pay unnecessary attention to. Oh, you have girlfriend. Oh, you have fornication. Oh, you have adultery. Oh, this one slept with that. Girl. Oh, big time, big sin, sin. This one smoked or he drank or used drugs. Oh, big time sin. These are the outward things that we are talking about. And Jesus said, those things that are from outward, they don't defile a man. What really defines a man is what's coming from inside. It is the attitude of the uh, our heart. He said what defines a man is coming from inside of him. That is what, it's not the smoking and the drinking of. And even the fornication service, he that does fornication, he sins against his own flesh. That's his own problem. But the greater sins in the eyes of God are these attitudinal sins. Are these sins of, mm, that we don't see. Sins of attitude, sins of the heart. That's what Jesus said. It is the Things that come from the heart, like how to treat how you treat people, put other people down above others, and just you know look down on other people. Those are the greatest sins. And that will say you sin, but we don't even in our churches today, even from pastor, from bishop and senior pastor, GOs to ordinary pastors, they are committing this sin, and they will be punishing other members in church that you that is smoking or that is having sex or having you know other kind of or dressing. Somehow, you know, he's not, he didn't dress well. He didn't, he, that is a sin. But what they are doing is not sin. But Bible is saying here, God himself directly says it. That when you treat people like that with preferential treatment, when you treat people like that, that you put one down above the other, when you don't use, when you neglect the weak, when you are not using your strength, the strength of the church to strengthen the weak, to uplift the weak, the Bible says you are sinning. But even you are committing more sin when you are telling people that you have better seats. I'm sure you have that in your church. Some of you have that in your church. Where you have the rich people have special seats. The, the, the honorable people have special seats. But the poor man doesn't have a seat. It's like the Bible says when you do that, you are sinning. 
Of course, the Bible said to honor those who honor his deal, right? If a king comes to your church or a politician comes to your church, we, are, we understand that you have to honor them. But honor ordinary member of the church too because they are the weakest and they must even be more honored, the Bible says. Because the Bible also said that honor all men. Not just honor kings. Not just honor uh, you know, elders and leaders. But honor all men. It says to honor all men too. So here it says you are sinning if you show respect to persons and lack of respect to others. And you are already convinced and convicted. You are convicted by the law as transgressors. That's what it says in verse 9. You are, we are already, even the law itself condemns us as transgressors when we treat people with preferential treatment. By the way, if you have not yet shared this link, share this message, please take your I mean, go under your video right now. Go under that video. Take your telephone or whatever you have and look for the share button and, you know, press the share button and share it publicly because this could deliver some churches or some people. Then the Bible says in verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law. So all these holy, holy, holy that people will see in church. All of us are holy, holy, holy. I'm not sinning. I'm not smoking. I'm not... Uh, Drinking, I'm not uh, sleeping around. See what the Bible says in the New Testament. Oh, if who's, that if you whosoever shall keep all the law, the whole law, and yet offend in one, or and the one of the offense is talking about is to have preferential treatment, not to honor the weaker vest, the weaker members, but to honor the the the, the ones that are strong and powerful. He said, even if you keep all the laws, you are already a sinner. Because you are guilty of all. He that offends in all is guilty of all. So don't bring that self-righteousness here. We already condemned all of us. Because just by this attitude alone, our culture, especially in Nigeria, what do you call it? Circumstances. Uh, what do you call it? When you are, people are respecting people, uh, other people, just to... Uh, Sarcophants, sarcophants. Psycho, we are all sarcophants. Sarcophants in the sense that we are just respecting people because they are in our culture. Our culture encourages sarcophants. Our culture is all about, you know, respecting people because of their status. Our culture doesn't teach us that everybody demands respect. Our culture doesn't teach us that every person must be respected only based on one fact. On the fact that that person is created in the image and likeness of God. If any individual was created in the image and likeness of God, you must respect him equally, just like you respect any other person who is successful. But in our culture, they will be you know, prostrating to you, they will be kneeling down to you, just because you are the big man of God, because you are the big pastor. But to the other person, ah, you, you kneel down to me now. We are, we are brought that to the church. So, we are already condemned. The Bible said the Bible, the law even has already condemned us as trans, 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 transgressors. Sacrifants. Our churches is full of sacrifants. We are, we honor the men of God, the big givers, and we, we think we are only more than the ones in the street who are smoking or drinking. The Bible said there is no difference. So, because if you sin in this one, uh, you have just like you have seen in everything else. This is James chapter 2. He's written down there black and white. These are the things that you must never do. It is, is the, this is the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem, James, who is writing this. He says, For if there are come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring, that's rich, in golden apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him, but here, we are not just violating this injunction, no. We are even recording it. This one that James is talking about is just if they came in and, you know, you recognize, gave him more recognition than the other one. But what we are doing, we have built a system around iniquity. We have built a whole system to just be systematically honoring the ones in big apparel with big boss and big money. And we don't even know where some of those people are getting their money. Some of those who are getting a, a drug addict. 
Some of them, they are drug pushers, or what do you call them? You know, drug byron, barons. Some of them are, you know, I'm robbers. Some of them are, we don't even know why they are. That's why God said, don't be respect of people. So he says, if you just recognize one more than the other, based on what they have, he has the spirit of mammon. So God condemns it and said, it is a sin because it is the spirit of mammon. Mammon has hijacked the church in Nigeria. You know, and now I think some of you will now begin to understand me better when I say there is no more church in Nigeria. Of course, I know God always has 7,000 that is left, you know, like Elijah's story. God is always having a remnant. But apart from those remnants that nobody knows, the things that we, the, all those people that we call church, all those places that we call churches, we don't have church in that country. <laughs> Not just in Nigeria alone. We don't have church again. Fini, finito. We have been corrupted in and out. We are just practicing everything. In fact, Jesus himself will not recognize the kind, what we call churches today. We are doing everything outrightly against. I mean, it is one thing if it has not been written. Let's say we just say, okay, it's not written anywhere now. Huh? It's just, uh, okay, maybe you just think maybe it's not good morally. But this one is written, koro, koro, black, white. It's written clearly, in fact, glaring. Illustration, example, no, clear, clear description, but still, we just we just neglect the Bible, and we are the ones who are always saying, "Call the Bible, show me in the Bible, show me in the Bible. Oh, the Word of God is only the Word of God, and we are doing miracles. Now you will you now begin to think with your head and say, "Where is those miracles coming from? Where are those miracles coming from? Are they from God?" Or is miracle enough to validify to validify a church or a ministry or a minister? Miracle is not enough. Oh. That's why Jesus said, don't use miracle as validity for people. Don't use miracle as a proof. How can something be written here clearly like this? And people are now making it into a system, taking record of how much... How, so if, if the one here is only talking about the man that came with big money and big good apparel and gold. So in our church now, we have taken to the extent that maybe your own apparel is smaller than this one. Let's take the one that has the bigger apparel and the bigger gold. And then let's take a club and put them, give, put them under a club as the top donors and the top givers. And then we'll be giving them more honor. Just demonstratively against everything God has said. It's just like we have just decided to rebel against the spirit of Christ. And what is the spirit of Christ? The spirit of love. The spirit of love. Use rather the wealth of the rich. Teach them to go and take care of the ones that are poor. In fact, today in our churches, there are people who go to bed without food and there are people who just throw away food. And we don't even teach them to take care of each other. So if you say these things are churches, you call them churches, it's your problem. It's you who has compromised. We have so compromised. We have so compromised that we are just sitting down in those churches as if nothing is going wrong because we are so blind and we think we are going to heaven with these things you are seeing now are you sure of your heaven now are you even sure you are saved again we don't even know what whether the salvation they have preached to us is even true or fake everything is just oppressive and we are thinking that it's the politicians who are oppressing the church has started oppression before politicians that's why you know whatever happens in the spirit that's what happens in the natural. It is what has happened in the spirit realm in the churches. That's what is happening in the, city, in the city, in the country. So if you have respect for him that wears the, the, the good clothing and say unto him, sit down here in a good place and say to the poor, stand down there or sit under here. You are partial in yourself and have become judges of evil thoughts. You have become evil. Your thoughts have become evil. You have become damned, damned, judged. So many things are wrong in the church today. So many things are going wrong in the body of Christ, especially in Nigeria. It is just alarming. That same James, in the book of James, chapter 2, that whole book of James is supposed to be in every church. Everybody is supposed to put that chapter 2 of James and just be reading it, everybody. And, you know, use this to judge your church. According to this one, is this is it a church you are going to or a cult? Are you sure the thing the where you are going to is a church? 
James chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 says, Depart in, uh, if a brother or sister is naked or destitute or, or lack daily bread, and one of you tells him, Depart in peace. Be, I'm praying for you. So you are praying to be, God, save John, you depart in peace. May God provide for you warmth and food. So he said, depart in peace. May you be warm and filled. So you are praying for him. Why you see the need? That is what our churches are doing today. We are busy praying, praying. Go to the mountain. We'll pray for breakthrough. Why pray when you have the money in your account? Why pray when you have members of the church who could take care of that need? Why pray? What kind of prayer again do you need? You see a needy person. The person doesn't even need to ask you anything. So he says, if you do that, if you send the needy away, but you do not give him the things which he needs for his body, the Bible says, what does your faith profit you? Thus also, faith by itself, without that work to take care of that person, is dead. So you are not a believer. So can you imagine the kind of churches we have? All our churches are not, their faith is dead. They are not Christian. They are not believers. They are not recognized by God. I'm talking of churches that have needy people in the church. And don't take care of them. According to God, according to this scripture, those churches, their faith is dead. They are not church. God is not recognizing them at all. So and we are just thinking, oh, just repeat after me. Just... Uh, you know, repeat the prayer of salvation. That's the only thing you need. But God is saying you don't have faith. Your faith is, if you are not using your, if your faith doesn't have compassion in it, if your faith doesn't have love in it, if you, or your faith doesn't make your heart to shiver, if your faith doesn't make you to have compassion on other people, if your faith doesn't want you to wonder, well, help. It's not faith, though. Because if you have real faith, your heart will be bleeding. If you have real faith, you have to, you want to have compassion. If you have real faith, you, there's no way you'll be indifferent. That is the test for you. If you really have faith in God or not. If it is real faith in God, you will not be indifferent to the needy. If it is real faith in God, if it is the, this one God though, that we know that you believe in, you will respond. You will respond the same way the good Samaritan responded. But indifference, if you are callous and indifferent, you don't even respond to the need of the people, your faith is dead long time old. Maybe you came to faith, but it has become dead. And God is telling you there about it right now. Clear and plain. Let me leave James alone. Let's go. Let me show you some other truth from the Bible that could help deliver all of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 25 to 29. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 to 29. That is why I told you the other day that even you, if you are a real Christian, your tithe and offering, you better use it for to take care of the brothers and sisters who are in need around you. Your tithe and offering, you better use it for to take care of people around you than to be taking it to some pastors that you don't know, you know what they do with it. The most important thing is that you use your tithe and offering for, not for yourself. You don't take it to yourself. That you put it aside to honor God. And the, the, way, the best way to do that is use your tithe and offering and use your own eyes. Open your eye, koro koro, like this. Open your eye and look for the needs around you. Kids who cannot pay for school fees. People who have been expelled from school. Uh... People who cannot take care of their old parents. Old women and old people who are dying of hunger. The needy, the hungry, the destitute. Go and look for them. Because Jesus said, I was hungry. It's me you fed, you fed or you refused to feed. I was naked. I was in prison. Tithe and offering, use it according to your own judgment. You can judge for yourself. And go and do what Jesus says you should do. These are the weightier matters of the law. 
These are the weightier matters of the law. Use your money, your tithe and offering. Go to your village. Look for people in problems, in destitute, destitution, in poverty. Use it and bring deliverance to them. That's when you are a Christian. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 25 to 29. We should never neglect the needy. We should never neglect the needy. 1 Corinthians 1, 25. The Bible says here, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see now, that is the logic, that is the wisdom of God, that we should take care more of the weak than the strong. That in the church, the people that must be given double honor, more honor, honor more honor, more, more respect, more dignity, more honor, are the part of the body that are weak, are the part of the body that are feeble, are the part of the body that are helpless, are the part of the body that are not attractive to us, are the part of the body that we think are useless. It, that's the wisdom of God. And God is saying, the reason why you must always take care of the weak, give more recognition to the weak, give more no, no, uh, no elevation, honor to the weak, is because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So why are we not seeing, if we are the foolish things of the world that God has chosen, why are you seeing other foolish things, other weak things, other disabled people, other dishonored, and you are neglecting them? Can't the wisdom of God tell us that that is where the greatest wisdom of God is? That is where the greatest wealth of God is? That is where the greatest power of God is? The greatest power of God is manifested in the, is, 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 is closed up in those people that we are despising. The greatest recognition of God are in those homeless children, those children people, those homeless children in the street, those drug addicts, those alcoholics. The greatest wisdom of God is in those old women, old men and women, all those people within that they are weak and are nobody and are useless and are not respected. It is not in the powerful and the mighty and the rich that we are honoring. That is the wisdom of God. Though. God always likes to do things like this. Look at me. I didn't wear shoes till I was around 12 years old. I never saw my father or my mother. I was always smelling when I was growing up in the village. But it is that weak, smelly, down and out, abandoned, outcast, that out of that, God made Sunday and Elijah that is a blessing to the world today. That's why in our church, Anybody can sit anywhere, even my own seat. Some, sometimes I go to dance in front, and by the time I come back, some people have sat in my own place. Some of them are alcoholics or drug addicts or some of the people who are sick a little bit. Make them sit. No problem. We have all of them also have the same seat. There is no seat that is different from the other one in our church. In our church right now, the greatest missionary and member of our church, my greatest disciple, was an alcoholic. In fact, the greatest number of people who are doing the greatest miracles to God is using in this country are former drug addicts, alcohol, or something. That is the wisdom of God. The reason why God said we should pay more attention to the weak members. The reason why God said the weaker members are the ones that should take more, 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 more. We, we should, should have more of our time, more of our attention, more of our sacrifice, more of our investment, more of our recognition, more of our honor. It's because it is in them, it is in these people that we don't see, that don't dress well, that are dressed anyhow, that are smelling, that don't look respectable, that don't look responsible. It is in them and it is through them that the power of God is revealed. Even if it is not them, but by the, in concrete, by the time you use them, by the time you take care of them, by the time you take care of them, the power of God will be revealed through you. By the time you begin to bless them, take care of them, the grace of God, the glory of God, the wisdom of God will be coming to manifestation through your life. That is why God talks about giving. But when he talks about giving, God doesn't ever say, go and give, give it to the church, everything. 
But go and give to these disenfranchised people. Go and give to these, you know, lost people, to these weak people. Is the New Testament, is the Old Testament. Everywhere God is always in the real religion. True religion is to take care of the for the uh, of the weak, of the poor, of the uh, you know. The orphans, of the widows, of the strangers, of go and look for them and take care of them with all your resources. That is the real religion because that's where it is in them that your your wisdom is is hidden. It is in them your greatness is hidden. It is in them your wealth is hidden. Your your the, the, the you know your, your breakthrough, the heaven that God is talking about in Malachi chapter four, chapter chapter three, that everybody is talking about. Oh, I will open the door of heaven to you. Everything we think it is by giving money to the church. No. It is by bringing money to the storehouse. And the storehouse is not the church. And it says, why is he going to open the heavens? He's going to open the heavens because of verse 5. Because the money that is brought to the storehouse is supposed to be not the money, but the resources that is brought to the storehouse is supposed to be used to defend the weak. To defend the fatherless, to defend the and, and feed the widow and the and the and the orphans and the poor. If when, when the things that are brought to the storehouse are used to take care of those people, that is when God opens the windows of heaven for you. So the windows of heaven is dependent not on your tithe, but on what you do with that tithe. That's why I told you right now that you should use your tithe and open your eyes very well. And go and use it to the people that God has thought about. Because no church, I have never seen a church in my life that talks about Malachi 3 verse 5. I only know church that talks about Malachi 3, the jump verse 5, and just talk about verse 8 to, to 10. I've never seen a church in my life that talks about verse 5. And by verse 5 said, what should you use the tithe and offering for? Some people now are saying tithe and offering, tithe should be used for building. For maintenance. But it's not true. It's not written anywhere in the Bible that tithe and offering is for maintenance. So it's not written that tithe is for maintenance anywhere at all. Tithe is for the weak. Tithe is for the you know, for the disenfranchised people, for the, the for the for the for the for the for the orphans, for the fatherless, for the widows. Go and read it. Malachi 3 5. So it is corruption. Everything is corruption. The church of today is synonymous to corruption. That is why today, whenever, especially for people coming from Nigeria, when they tell me, I don't know, I don't go to church anymore. I'm no more going to church. I'm just meeting together with my friends somewhere or with my family. And we are studying the Bible ourselves. We are listening and we are growing. Then I know that that person is born again for him. Not just is born again, but he knows God. Because it will really take you boldness to know God before you could do the right thing. Because I don't know, it's going to be tough to see a church in Nigeria that does the right thing. It's going to be very tough. And not just Nigeria, but even Nigerian churches that are all over the world. Everybody is, it's no more church, but they use the name church. They put all kinds of titles, all kinds of names. And you are deceived, you don't even think. So because somebody said it's a church, just believe him. On what basis? See their practice, see the way they live. And compare their lifestyle to this to the to the scriptures, and see how Christian they are, if, how, if they are real Christian church or not. But God said it is it is no it is no accident that He said we should honor the weaker vessels, that we should honor the people who are who are disenfranchised, that we should honor the outcasts. The down and out, those are the ones we should honor. Those are the ones that we should give more glory to, with more honor to, more respect to. We should, we should you know, pay more attention to. The reason is because it is in them. It is the, the, he said the foolishness of God is wiser than that of men. The weakness of God is stronger than that of men. Because just like with you, brethren, how many of you were wise when you were called, according to the flesh? How many of you were mighty? How many of you were noble when you were called? But you were all weak. Now, God made you to be the rulers of the world. The same way, all of that people that are still weak today, all of that people that are still, you no know, feeble today, it is the power of God is going to be revealed through them. It is the wisdom of God that works that way. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world, you see, to confound the wise. He has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound 
the, 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 to confound the, the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised at God shows it, yes, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why if you come to our church here, you will see so many down and out people, alcoholic, drug addicts. In fact, the centrality of our church life as a church is all around drug addicts, alcoholics, uh, and everybody, nobody knows why. Because that's the wisdom of God. That is what has elevated me here. And many people ask for the secret of my ministry. When I tell them, go to the list of this, they say, ah, it's too difficult to work for them. They are smelling. They don't want to come to church. It's difficult. They are not serious. But that's where the power of God is hidden. When you begin to do that, when you begin to invest in the list of this, heaven will open to you. That is when that gate of heaven that we are talking about, the windows of heaven, that is how it, op it opens. You must use tight and nothing for what God wants. Not to bring to church and pastor, but to go and give and use for this list one of the people. Now, let me address this other thing that I've addressed one time, but let me address it again. Because I heard that people still talk about it up to now in church. That the pastors recognize only people who, who are good givers, who are either titers or they are good givers. So you, if you are a giver, then you can have access to pastor. But if you are not a giver, you cannot have access to pastor. And they also teach that you give only to people who are already blessed. You don't give to people who are not blessed yet. <laughs> so you, since the pastor is the one that is most blessed, everything comes to him. Because he's the one that is most blessed. He's the one that is anointed. The anointed man of God. They even say you shouldn't go to see a man of God without taking the gifts. So I said, if you cannot give to somebody who is below you, then God himself is the first one to, to be guilty of that. Because God gave us his only begotten son. He's above all of us. All. But he's, he went and gave to, to us who are downstairs. And Philippians chapter 2 says that he, Jesus left heaven, so God is guilty of giving to somebody who is lower than him. Because he gave to us, we are lower than him, he gave to us, so God is guilty. Then Jesus, who left heaven, where it was high, and came to give and made himself a slave. The Bible said that Jesus made himself a slave. He took the image of man, and he's the bigger one. He is bigger than any pastor, any bishop, any 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 geo, any any anybody is bigger than all of us. And despite that, he came down to our level, took our image to himself. So when you say you shouldn't give, in fact, I'm going to read it. When you say you shouldn't give to somebody lower, lower than you, what what about the example of Jesus? The example of Jesus is directly the opposite. The, the, the example of Jesus is directly the opposite. And he is our, our example. He is our perfect example. Philippians chapter 2 says, verse, Philippians chapter 2 verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, like Christ. Because having the same love, being of one accord, of, of one mind. Ah, sorry, verse 5. Verse 5, sorry. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, let this mind be in you also, which is in Christ. Is it in, okay, what is the mind that was in Christ now? Was well, that the same mind, this same mind that was in Christ must be in us. What is that mind? The mind that was in Christ that must be in us is that he, who Jesus, being in the form of God, he was highest. He was like in the place of God. He was God himself. He thought it not the robbery to be equal with God. He was equal with God. Yes? but made himself of no reputation. Today, we are rather, <laughs> we don't want to associate ourselves with people who don't have reputation. But Jesus got rid of his reputation. So that, and he came down to the level of people who are, of us, of people who don't have any reputation. So the way that is supposed to work in the church is that every pastor, every leader is supposed to be coming to the level 
of the poorest people and associate with them, hug them, talk to them, give them support. That is what it says that they should be honored. That it is the weakest of the people, the, the weakest, I mean, the, the most feeble, the most weak of all church members that should receive more attention, just like Jesus did. He gave more, the most attention to us in our weakness. He got himself, he got rid of his own glory, he got rid of his own honor, and came down to our level, remove all reputation. Some people are saying, oh, I cannot go to, we'll talk to those drug addicts or, or poor people or who are not titans, who are not givers, or people who, who are just, you know, who are unlucky because their bad luck will come to me, or who they are poor, their poverty will come to me. Jesus is saying the opposite. He got rid of his own glory. He got rid of his own reputation. He, he made himself, he stripped himself of everything. So that he would be like them. He took upon him, himself, the form of a servant. He even reduced himself to the level of man and made himself like a servant. And was made like him to man. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also, that is why God exalted him. See, the kind of people God exalts are only the people that could be like Christ, that could have the same mind like Christ. We should come to the level of prisoners and go and hug them and love them and take care of them. We should come to the level of the people in the hospital and take care of them, the orphans, the old people, the poor in our streets. This is Christianity right here. It is the kingdom of love. But instead of us living our high, high, high mountains, high hills, high horse, and come down to the level of people like Jesus did, we are actually building it, and we are building walls around us and saying, you know, we are honoring only the successful. We are honoring only the ones that are great. And we are going to give them reward at the end of the year. Certificate as the highest giver or the highest donor. The top giver. It is the corruption of the Bible. We've corrupted the word of God so, so much that even the son of God cannot recognize these this, this churches that we call churches again. Even Jesus himself will never recognize these things that we call churches. We have battered, butchered, and just useless Christianity so much that nobody wants to be a Christian anymore. If it is the kind of Christianity we are practicing, this is not, it doesn't have anything to do with God though, at all. This is not the church that the Lord Jesus Christ started. You, they say you should only give to people who are higher than you. you. So you should never go down because if you go and give to someone who is lesser than you, then you are going to be less. So what? why is it Jesus didn't become less? Why is it that God didn't become less? And they said, okay, never go to anybody's house or a pastor's house without bringing a gift. Never give, never go to see a man of God without taking some gifts with you. On one hand, it's a good culture. Yes, if you want to talk about it from the cultural, cultural point of view, yes, I agree. Don't go to visit, not just pastors, why just pastors? Anybody. If you want to be cultured and well brought up, anybody you want to go and visit, take something with you and bless them. Especially the poor. It's not support, this thing is not supposed to relate to evil men of God. You are supposed to be preaching this, that don't ever go to the house of any poor person without taking money or without taking goods with you. It is more for the poor than for the rich. So he says, when he said, never go visit a man of God without a gift, is a manipulation to make all the, all the pastors become the ones that have all the money. First of all, it's a good culture. Practice it, everybody. You don't need to be a Christian to even practice that. But it's even more Christian that we should turn it around and say, don't ever go ye to the hand of, to the house of any needy person. Don't ever go to see any needy member. Don't ever go to the house of any poor person without taking a gift with you. That will be more Christian. Because, okay, if we are talking like this, that we must only give to somebody that is, that is higher than you, what happened with the three wise men? They were coming to Jesus, a child, and they brought gift. It's just because it's a good culture. 
Oh, my God, oh, because Jesus is higher than them even though he was a child. He was a great man. That's why they bring brought gifts. Okay, then let's continue. There are other scriptures, like for example, he says, in that James that we read, James chapter 2, 15 to 17, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute, hungry, and one of you said, and he comes to you to ask for help, and you came to, and you say, go in peace, and you know, I pray, I will pray for you, you'll be warm and, and, and you get something to eat. The, the Bible says, and you did not give them, if you send them away, and you did not give them what they need to take care of their needs, that you are not a believer. That you are not a believer. You don't have faith. You don't have faith in Christ. You are not a Christian. James 2, 15 to 17. So it means, because when he's talking here, that if a poor person without food comes to me, definitely if he's coming to me to ask for food, it means I'm higher than him. And here he says I should give to him. So where is the cause? If, he's going, if, he, if John had known that if I would give to that person without food and I would become poor myself, he would not say do it. But he said if you don't do it, that's when you are cursed. That's when you become poor. But when you do it, that's when God commends you. That's when God praises you. And he said if he comes to you without clothes, who comes to me without clothes? It means they come to me because I have clothes, doesn't have clothes. So I should be giving. God is expecting me and even commanding me to give to someone lower than me. So that doctrine that you don't give to the lesser than you, you only give to people above you, is from hell. It's a manipulation of the word of God. Uh, because uh, Melchizedek and Abraham give to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is not a man. Is somebody that was without man, I mean, without father or mother, without origin. Is that was Jesus? All of us should be giving our life and tithe and everything to Jesus. And the way you give to Jesus, He said, "I was naked, you didn't feed, you didn't clothe me. I was hungry, you didn't feed me." When you give to these ones, you give to me. That is Jesus. So if you really want to give your tithe, give to the tithe your tithe to Jesus. And to give your sight to Jesus is to give it to the weak, to the naked, to the hungry, to the people in hospital, to the destitute, to the outcast, to the orphans, to the you know fatherless, to the widows. That is Jesus right there. To the needy. He said, it is me who was naked. It is me who was hungry. That is who Abraham gave tight to. You want to give tight? Give it to Melchizedek like he did. Give it to Jesus. And Jesus is in those people who are who, who, who are desperate. And that's what he's saying here. If you cannot give to the poor, if you don't give to that person that is hungry, that is, you know, you know and you say you should go and you'll be praying for him, you are not a believer. He said, your faith is dead. You don't have faith. Your faith, if you believe in Christ, you will manifest his nature. If you believe in God, you will manifest God's nature. And God's nature is love. That's why tithe and offering were instituted for love. Tithe and offering were instituted to take care of the needy and disenfranchised people in the society. Tithe and offering were instituted by God to take care of, to give, bring justice and to the, to the society, to bring equality to the society, and to take care of the weightier matters of the law. Let me read one more scripture before I go. Luke chapter 7, 44 to 46. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water. This is concerning the one that you cannot go to the house of a man of God without a gift. Now, this is Jesus himself. He, he went to the house of somebody. The person didn't even give him water and Jesus was not complaining. And Jesus still went. The person didn't even, uh, the person didn't even give Jesus uh, water, he didn't give him water, he didn't give him food. Even though Jesus was the biggest of all, all of us, the biggest of all prophets, and somebody went to see him, not just went to see him, he went to the other person's house, and other people went there, and nobody brought anything apart from that woman. So if anybody was supposed to be, you know, capitalizing on that, that you must always come with something to see the man of God, Jesus is the number one person that was supposed to capitalize on that. But Jesus didn't demand that people should come to him with things. He even tolerated them. If not because of the situation with that woman that Jesus wanted to teach the, 
the, the other people, the Simon, he wouldn't have even mentioned it. And I'm sure Jesus entered into the, life, into the house of many, many people and they didn't give him anything. And many people came to him without bringing anything. The man that came to Jesus in the night uh, that says, how can I be? Huh? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. It, it, it was not recorded there that Nicodemus brought some gift to Jesus. So that doctrine, just because of the, because, you know, because of the and one singular uh, situation, scenario that happened that Esau, or what is the name? Esau, Saul, the king, uh, was uh, they about to be king, one, two, said, I cannot go. In fact, it was not even he who said, the servant said, don't go to see the man of God, Samuel, without a gift. So take a gift with you to see the man, before you go to see the man, which is a sign of honor. We are now taking that and capitalizing on it and making it into a doctrine. I mean, what a corrupt mindset we have. So that people will just be bringing to us. Of course, you could use that as an example to teach everybody, but the most people, the most, the most needy people are the ones you should not go to see without gifts. Not the men of God. Jesus, people, Jesus was meeting with people, nobody was bringing him gifts. The woman with the issue of blood, what gift did she take? So before she could go and see Jesus. The blind Bartimaeus that was crying, son of David, have mercy on me. What gift did she have to give to him? You cannot go and see man of God without gift? You kidding me? All the people that Jesus healed, all the people that the apostles healed, what gift did they come, come with? These are just deceptive doctrines that are just made to manipulate children of God and rip them off their hard-earned money. It's a pity. It's a disgrace. That all these doctrines are in the church. Despite what Jesus... I mean, look at Luke chapter 16. In fact, I think we should read it. You know the story of uh, the rich man and... Uh, what was his name? Zacchaeus, Lazarus. You know the story of Lazarus and the rich man? This is all about it. Everybody recognized the rich man. And that's what we are doing in the church today. Oh, we recognize the one with the money. Oh, you are giving. They were the top giver. We have to celebrate the top giver. But heaven never recognized the rich man. But heaven was recognizing the poor man. It is the poor man that heaven recognized. And today, we are not recognizing poor people. We are recognizing the rich. Rather, God told, Jesus told, Jesus understood this. And Jesus told the rich man that was coming after him, go and sell all your goods and give to the poor. The kingdom of God, that's how it is manifested, through love. If you really love me, show that love by showing that love to ordinary men. Go sell all your goods and give to the poor. The poor is the burden of God. That's why I say your tithe and offering should be meant for the poor, first of all. It didn't say go and sell all your goods and take it to the church. Today, it is the opposite preaching. They, all the teachers and preachers and pastors and bishops say, go and sell this, go and sell your something and bring offering to church. So people are selling their cars, their houses and bring it to church. Nobody is saying go and give to the poor. We have turned the scripture and the Bible on Jesus' head. We have hijacked and raped and abused the scripture altogether. Jesus himself will not recognize this church again, no. I mean, these churches, oh. So this church, they don't have anything. Most churches, they don't have anything to do with God again. They have divorced themselves with God. They have just divorced themselves with God or from God all over. And it's horrible what is happening. And if you have the fear of God, let him that have hear, hear what the Spirit of God is saying. I hope you, you people are ministered to today. And that practice of distinguishing or, you know, giving recognition to highest givers or to highest titles is not scriptural, to say the least. It is driven by and dictated by greed and the God and the spirit of mammon, not the spirit of God. Christ and the, the, the kingdom of God is totally the opposite.